that. Hi, everybody. We'll start this again. I apologize. I had myself on mute. Uh, but today we're going to focus on California's north coast. Um, you know, a lot of times I will take a quick moment to do a sort of a pre-shift or an aside before we get started on a presentation. Um, today, I think we're going to take a look at some critical, critical regions. The California North Coast, of course, includes uh, both Napa uh, Valley and Sonoma Coast, or Sonoma County, excuse me, which are some pretty critical wine regions to be familiar with. I know myself, um, as a young sommelier for many years, uh, would field questions on California wines um, that I didn't necessarily know all of the answers to, um, sadly. And I, I had guests, especially um, in steakhouses and in restaurants that were familiar with Napa Valley um, as a whole it had been there. They could tell you where Mustard's Grill was or how many times they'd had dinner at Bouchon and where they went to off of Highway 29 or off of the Silverado Trail or the places that they stayed. And I think um, I wasn't as familiar with that for many years. Um, so uh, I, I do know that uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with California wines, but I think it's also a good opportunity right now uh, to take a step back, to take a look at the North Coast and really ask yourself, how much do I actually know about Napa Valley? How much do I actually know about Sonoma Coast, Sonoma County wines? And can I speak to them with uh, intelligence, uh, whenever a guest in either a retail shop or in a restaurant setting, or just casually at you know family gathering, somebody wants to talk about these wines. So let's take a deeper look. We're gonna start with a whole bunch of history we're going to run through the history first, uh, and then we'll get into some map work. You guys know I love looking at maps, and we'll look at each of the major subregions uh, in more detail. So we start early, uh, 1800s, 1836, with George, yeah, excuse me, George Young awarded uh, the Rancho Camus, a 12,000-acre plot of land that included southern Napa in 1836. Uh, he would go on to plant the first Napa Valley vineyard in 38 or 39. Uh, then you see the gold rush create sort of a population boom in the area, uh, really grew to 15,000 acres in the 1880s, only to decline to less than 3,000 uh, due to phylloxera by 1890. You couple that with World War I and Prohibition, uh, the valley really slips into decline. Um, there's an allowance of making 200 gallons of fruit juice per household that shifted the varietal focus at the time to Alicante Boucher, Petit Syrah, Zinfandel, and Carignan by 1926. And really, that focus created vine acreage increases in the 1920s. Uh, pretty interesting considering that Prohibition was in place. Uh, of course, Prohibition would end in 1933, just four years after the Great Depression had begun. And so, still in decline, the valley uh, opens a lot of new wineries that open with poor sanitation, causing flawed wines to be produced for several decades. And then you see sort of the importance of sugar come into play, um, and we'll speak to that on the next slide, but uh, really the fast food generation of, and soda um, is seeking a lot of sugar, and you see that in winemaking as well. George de la Tour uh, would later go to France to find himself a winemaker and return with Andre Chelichev. Uh, he would transform winemaking in the valley with standards on cleanliness, sanitation, and thoughts on which grapes actually would work in which sites the best. Uh, later, John Daniel Jr. and George Dower of Inglenook and Peter Mondavi of Charles Krug would develop improvements in malolactic fermentation and temperature control that certainly would help with the freshness and styles of wines. The 1960s brings us French barriques and stainless steel fermentation tanks. Um, dry wine, as we mentioned earlier, didn't overtake sweet wine sales until 1967. Mondavi opens in Oakville in 1966. Then you get Chapelet. Sterling, Diamond Creek, and Spring Valley Vineyards in the late 1960s. In 1968, there was an agricultural preserve enacted to limit the development within Napa Valley. Then you start to see the 70s with flower power. And this is where we get rise to wineries such as Dunn, Foreman, and Corison that farm their own fruit and make it themselves, sort of a new thing. Um, 1976, we see the Judgment of Paris by Stephen Spurrier to celebrate the United States' 200th birthday. Um, of course, Chateau Montalena Chardonnay and Stag's Leap SLV Cabernet take the top marks in each category. But I think it's important, um, thanks to Gilsom, they uh, published this tally of all of the total scores. I think it's important to take a look at it, right? So you can see Montalena 
uh, with 132 points, being pretty clearly the top Chardonnay, beating out Domaine Rulo's Merceau Charm. That's impressive, right? But I think also impressive is Shalom up here uh, with 121 points in Spring Mountain Vineyard, outclassing Clos de Mouche. And where Batard Montrachet from Domaine Ramenet Proudhon sits at 94 points, and Le Flaves Pouligny Montrachet Le Pucelles at 89 points. Uh, unfortunately, Peter Crest and David Bruce didn't fare quite as well as that one. And then with Cabernet, you see the, the glut of growth classifications, Mouton, Aubryon, and Montrose right here in second, third, and fourth place, respectively, just behind Stag's Leap's SLB. A little closer reveal there uh, before you get down into a handful of other producers here. Pretty cool. We continue with, uh, with history beyond um, the judgment of Paris that really spurs the opening of these wine critic uh, uh, platforms, starting with the wine advocate in 1978, followed by the wine spectator in 1979. Um, Napa Valley is de delimited in 1981. Um, you start to see French investment in wineries, namely Clos Val, Domaine Chandon, Opus One, of course, and Domaine Carneros from the 70s and 80s. Uh, we get drip irrigation coming online in the late 1970s, which creates more area for cultivation, more places that you can get water to, to actually produce grapes. The 1980s brings the era of the consulting winemaker. At 86, phylloxera is spread by flooding, which causes massive replants to AXR1. And then again, we find that AXR1 is phylloxera uh, not resistant and, and gets hit in the, in the early 1990s. So at this point, everybody has an opportunity. They've got 20 plus years, almost 30 years of growing wines in the area. Um, they're faced with a massive replant. They have a lot of Chardonnay and they know that wine drinking tr trends are moving towards Cabernet Sauvignon and that these critically acclaimed Cabernet Sauvignons are uh, fetching higher dollars. So Cabernet replaces Chardonnay in most of the valley in the 1990s. That French influence in a lot of different areas comes into play here at, at this time as well. You start to see Bordeaux viticultural techniques mirrored through uh, vertical shoot positioning, low fruiting zones, and high density planing that was intended to maximize sun in the marginal climate in Bordeaux. In California, it had created extremely intense fruit. We start to see cult wineries emerge. This is Dalla Harlan Estate, Screaming Eagle, Colgan. And then 1997 comes along. It's a warm vintage, but it's also extremely abundant. Tank space was pretty limited, so the grapes were harvested in two crops. The first one was fermented, while the second crop hung on the vine. Got those out of the tank, and they went back out in the vineyards, and they said, oh my God, look at all this fruit. It's big, it's juicy, it's concentrated, it's got soft tannin, less acid. Let's pull this second crop in as well, and we'll throw those in the tank. And so when those wines started coming out in 1999 and 2000, they were met with critical acclaim uh, from those wine advocate and wine spectator critics. And now everyone said, okay, now we've had about 10 years of making Cabernet here in the Valley. We know what people want. We're going to let grapes hang on the vine. It's going to be long hang time, big firm tannins, um, high alcohol content, very sugary styles, and less acidity. Well, those wines were very important from 2000 to 2008. Uh, in 2008, the stock market crash kind of led to a shift in California winemaking. Um, we also, for those of us that were sommeliers at the time, we were drinking the 97s in our wine cellars and saying, I think we screwed this up. Uh, the 1998s, which were considered to be sort of a working vintage, uh, had more acidity. They were bright, they were delicious, they were hanging on, they had life in them still. The 97s were becoming flabby and dull in a lot of cases. So we saw a shift away towards a brighter style of winemaking post 2008, I would say. Robert Parker retires in 2011, which causes several key players that were replanting their 1980s vines to focus on broader canopies, creating more elegant styles with less alcohol, more acidity, but still with plenty of polish. The North Coast counties, um, if we look beyond just Napa Valley, Napa Valley is 4% of California's production, but 25% of the state's annual wine revenue shows you just how critical it is. Sonoma is almost 500,000 acres. It's a huge area of land. 
You've also got Mendocino and Lake in the north, Solano just south, uh, and Marin County. And Solano includes uh, Solano County Green Valley, Suisun Valley ABA, and just a little sliver of the wild horse, right? I think it's important to include this uh, because of the, the uh, impact of Suisun Valley with the new game of Suisun wines that are out there. We're going to focus by looking at really a lot of the subregions in Napa and Sonoma today, of course. We're going to gloss over Mendocino and Lake and not say much about uh, Solano or Marin counties. Uh, here's a pretty rudimentary map that shows you uh, the North Coast ABA up here, Suisun Valley, as we mentioned, Solano Green Valley, and Solano County. And that's our one slide that you're going to get with Solano today. To the north of Napa and Sonoma, and this, I like this map because it kind of gives you uh, a perspective on how big these areas are too. Uh, you can see Lake County is a continuation of Napa North, and Mendocino is sort of a continuation of Sonoma North. And you can see that in the grape varieties that perform well in both of those areas. Here's a, a sort of a, a look at the counties that surround the San Francisco Bay Area. Again, sort of just focusing on the size of Sonoma, uh, the size really of Solano too. There's a lot of fruit coming out of here. Uh, Marin County here, and then of course Napa. Pretty cool to look at. And a deeper look at Mendocino County. I think it's important uh, to take a quick zoom in on this. You find uh, Dos Rios and Covello way up in the north portion of it. But really, for the most part, everything's down here. And you see Mendocino Ridge. Um, this is a minimum 1,200 foot above sea level uh, area. Just in inland of that, though, is uh, Anderson Valley, which is perhaps the most important of the wine growing areas within Mendocino County. Great for Pinot Noir, of course. Um, here you'll find Yorkville Highlands. This little sliver right here is Palm, Pine Mountain Cloverdale Peak that is shared with Sonoma. We're going to talk a little bit more about that when we move into Sonoma. Uh, I think it's also important to note uh, cities of Ukiah right up here, right? Navarro, important to look at, Mendocino way up here. Uh, you also find Mendocino, uh, excuse me, Redwood Valley up here in Eagle Peak and Potter Valley. And then this little tiny sliver that is Coal Ranch. It's basically a, a, a monopole of a winery by the name of Estralina that I think is now shuttered. Uh, there's also McDowell Valley. Uh, that's not listed here. That's another uh, monopole ABA that was started in 1981. But I think uh, as you look at these, you know, pay attention to the Navarro River. Um, that's where Anderson Valley is, and then a portion of the Mendocino Ridge here. We mentioned that elevation for Mendocino Ridge. And then, of course, Pine Mountain, Cloverdale Peak. Pretty new. That's the newest one in 2000. Well, I guess Eagle, Eagle Peak, Mendocino County in 14, but shared with Sonoma. Uh, important to note. Lake County has seven AVAs. Uh, Lake County is interesting. It's got high elevations. Uh, the Clear Lake here is the largest body of fresh water in California. Uh, so you have these really high summer temps that are moderated by diurnal shifts due to the lake effects, uh, which is why it's Lake County, right? Your average elevation here is 1,500 feet above sea level, with some of these wineries reaching to 3,000 feet. So you get some high elevation stuff here. Uh, they do have the purest air in all of California, which is backed up uh, by the EPA. You want to look at uh, a little closer look here. You'll find Benmore Valley. It's it's kind of more further away from the lake in a little cooler area. The big deal here, though, is Clear Lake. It's all of this green area. Super important. Um, up, abutting the lake, you've got Big Valley District, Lake County, and Kelsey Bench, Lake County. Down south is Red Hills, Lake County, and to the east, you'll find High Valley. Uh, which is pretty high elevation. This is 1,600 to 3,000 feet uh, required. And Red Hills Lake, you'll see how mountainous it was and hilly. This is right on the footsteps of Mount uh, Quinopti. And then down here in the south, this little guy, not to be forgotten, is Quinnick Valley, established in 1981. And really, that's our Lake County slide. Now we're going to get into both Napa Valley and Sonoma County. And uh, we'll take a, a deeper look at the maps and what AVAs sit within them and why these AVAs have been lined out the way that they are. And Napa Valley, the TTB, tends to sort of avoid conflict when they create AVAs as the Napa Valley AVA stretches well east of that back of mountain chain uh, because large producers want to fortify their blends with bulk fruit. That's important here. Uh, there are 16 nested AVAs in Napa Valley today. 
the Oakville and Rutherford benches were actually proposed to have their own distinct AVAs on the western end of both of those AVAs in 1989, but they were shot down by non-benchland producers. Two major roads that bisect the valley itself, uh, the Silverado Trail to the east and Highway 29. Here's a look at Napa Valley. Um, I love these maps from Wine Folly. I think they're extremely uh, detailed and simple to look at. Um, here you can kind of get a feel for what we've got. You can see Heldsburg here to the northwest and up to the Clear Lake here. Here's Lake Berryessa, Lake Hennessy right here in the center. We're going to start uh, in the north by looking at Calistoga, Diamond Mountain, Howl, Howl Mountain, excuse me. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at some of these unofficial AVAs, uh, Deer Park and Con Valley, but perhaps most important is the Pritchard Hill area, excuse me, that's not an AVA. None of these are AVAs, they're unofficial, right? Calistoga in the north, extremely volcanic soils due to the surrounding mountains. The lowest point here is 350 feet above sea level. Um, on the eastern side, you find the Isley Vineyard on an alluvial fan. It's the largest diurnal swing in all of Napa here. Um, you'll find also Chateau Montalena, uh, Larkmead, and Three Palms in the area. The Howl Mountain to the east has to be 1,400 feet above sea level. Um, this is basically the fog line, right? So they want to they want to produce wines that are mountainous, that are above the fog line, that have cooler temperature but more sunlight, rocky soils that terrain really well and stress the vines, and you get smaller fruit typically with a little more astringent tannin, a little more long lived. This is eight by three miles. It's tiny, right? It's rocky, poor thin soils. Uh, we mentioned that cooler daytime temps, but more direct sunlight. Uh, done for really traditional styles. Donna, outpost for modern and showy. You'll also find Zinfandel here uh, for Turley under their rattlesnake and dragon vineyards. Diamond Mountain, it's really the smallest mountain AVA in Napa Valley. Ritchie Creek is uh, the dividing line between Diamond and Spring Mountains. And this is just a collection of jagged hills. Um, they're volcanic soils with really poor fertility. Uh, you'll find Constant, Diamond Creek, and Perhaps most important, Schramsberg uh, was the first to plant mountain vineyards uh, on Diamond Mountain in the uh, 1800s. Childs Valley, pretty sleepy. It's, uh, it gets some, some steep slopes. You'll find Volker Isley there, um, but you don't see a ton of stuff coming out of there. As we mentioned before, I wanted to take a, a little more in-depth look at Pritchard Hill. And uh, you can see here off Sage Canyon Road and that, that eastern uh, major trail, the Silverado Trail, is Lake Hennessy. And just southeast of Lake Hennessy, you'll find this collection of some of the most sought after wines in Napa Valley. Uh, perhaps the most important, Chapelet that owns the rights to the Pritchard Hill Elevation Vineyard uh, label. And uh, some would say they are behind not wanting to change or have an official APA because they don't want all these other people uh, building off the name that they uh, really built. Continuum uh, is here as well, along with Colgan. Uh, you'll find Ovid. David Arthur with their Elevation 1147. Uh, Bryant family is here too. I mean, it's just amazing what you see right here in these, these, uh, these wineries. Uh, so it's really a mountain between Atlas Peak and Howell Mountain in the Vaca Range to the east there with really beautiful volcanic soils. Uh, we mentioned a few of the producers. Con Valley um, is just north of there in the eastern slopes of Howell Mountain. You'll find Bonds, Melberry Vineyard, You'll find CV and Fairchild. And then sort of that area between uh, St. Elena and Howe Mountain um, that sits between the 400 foot elevation maximum of St. Elena and 1400 foot elevation minimum of Howe Mountain is a little area called Deer Park. And uh, you've got some fantastic wines coming out of there as well. And that's right here. See that gap? Interesting, huh? This is where elevation peaks at 400 feet. And then this area between is 400 to 1400, and then the 1400 foot elevation minimum to get to Howl Mountain. And then Con Valley kind of sits over here between Giles and Howl Mountain, the eastern slopes. Cool. Back to the official subregions or nested AVAs in Napa Valley. We find ourselves in Spring Mountain, just on the other side of that Ritchie Creek. Uh, no real mountain here, just a collection of peaks and valleys. Uh, dominated by Spring Valley Vineyards, you'll find Kane, Vineyard 7 and 8, you'll find Pride, Newton, Barnett, Barrens, Stony Hill, uh, Philip Togney. Uh, then you get down into St. Helena. This is probably the hottest uh, area up valley. Uh, morning fogs that come from uh, 
down south typically burn off before they make it this far up valley. The western portions have gravelly loam and river rocks. If you think of like Beckstopper Las Piedras, right, which is named Beckstopper the Rocks, uh, it's named that for a reason. The eastern section is the bench of Howl Mountain, known as Spring Valley, and this is home to Heights and Joseph Phelps. Then you get down into Rutherford. Thomas Rutherford married George Allen's granddaughter in 1864, who was given a thousand acres as her dowry. Um, this is where you'll find cake bread, Quintessa, BB, Ingle Nook, a lot of Beckstopper stuff. You'll find frog sleep, you'll find Staglin. Um, the bench, of course, Rutherford Bench is the best area for growing to the western side as you get into the foothills of the Mayacamas range. Oakville, uh, this is Toklon's alluvial fan, is basically an extension of that Rutherford Bench that we mentioned. Um, here you find gravelly, gently sloping and deep soils. Uh, the eastern side away from the benchland is more volcanic. Uh, here you'll find some of the greatest producers in Opus One, Robert Mondavi, Beckstock from Tokalon, of course, Dalavala, Farniente, Groth, Harlan, McDonald, Martha's, uh, Rudd, Silver Oak, and BHR. Uh, Yonville, lots of rocky knolls, very foggy, Gurgich, Cap Sandy, uh, Napanook, and Dominus. And I think it's important to note too, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but that that San Pablo Bay that bro blows in the cool, cooling winds uh, up through the valley that creates the fog that you see in the south that tends to burn off by the time it gets up to uh, Santa Elena. Also, I think important to note, and maybe we should add this to a future uh, Napa Valley slide, but that Beckstoffer Tokalon vineyard uh, has a lot of history to it there in Oakville, dating back uh, to the turn of the century when it was a much larger area. Uh, it was trimmed down to about 82 acres uh, at one point. Uh, it's now owned by uh, Opus One uh, and Robert Mondavi, known just as Tokalon. Uh, there are two small producers there, McDonald and Detert, that are also allowed to produce wines, but may not utilize the name Tokalon or Beckstoffer Tokalon. And then of course, Andy Beckstoffer owns the area known as Beckstoffer Tokalon. So kind of split up, a little, po little political and silly, but there's great wines to be had there for sure. Uh, as we move to the uh, middle of the valley, you find yourself at Stag's Leap District. Uh, these are ancient landslides off the Vacas that left knolls creating east-facing slopes uh, that funnel cool air. It's the only valley floor ABA that does not cross the river, surrounded by Yonville on all other sides except for the east, where it faces the Palisades Mountains. Uh, here you've got a lot of sandstone and shale, and then volcanic to the east. You'll find that's pretty common, right? Volcanics to the east, and then sandstone and shale in the center. And then you find more loam to the west. Uh, SLV and Fay are in the south on big alluvial fans. Nathan Fay planted the area's first post-prohibition Cabernet here in 1961. Um, Stag's Leap Wine Cellars was formed in 73 and then eventually purchased that Fay vineyard. You'll also find Schaefer, uh, Rigucci, Pine Ridge, Hartwell, Silverado, Steltzner, and Robert Sensky here. Mount Veter to the west in the Maya Camas range is supremely undeveloped because a lot of it is above the regulated 30 degree slope. There's laws in Napa Valley that say that you cannot plant up beyond a 30 degree slope for fear of uh, erosion in the vineyards. So the coolest of the mountain ABAs uh, here due to its proximity to Carneros, it's craggy, it's rocky, it's shallow soils. Uh, there's a little volcanic with mostly shale and sandstone and clay and sandy loam. Uh, just across the ridge is Moon Mountain uh, in Sonoma. And here you'll find Hess, Mycamus, and Lagier Meredith. And you can see that's Mount Veter here. Just on the other side here is Moon Mountain as you get into Sonoma. Uh, and being that it abuts Carneros, you'll realize why it's a cooler area. Uh, to the east and south, we find Atlas Peak. Most of the acreage here belongs to Stagecoach and the Antica Project by Antonori. Uh, the peak is over 2,600 feet above sea level. Uh, most southerly of the Vaca Mountains, it's shallow, rocky, and low in fertility, lots of volcanic and iron. Uh, great producers here are Kongsgard and Al Uh You'll find the Oak Knoll, too, dry, cool, very foggy, um, heavy clay soils that favor Merlot to Cabernet. Uh, you'll find Blackbird and Trefet in here. Coombsville, uh, really the last of the AVAs and uh, perhaps the hippest of them today. It's east of the river and it sits in a bowl. It's um, at the footsteps of the Vaca Mountains. Essentially, it's a sunken volcano. Uh, here you'll find Palmas, Meteor, The Judge, and Caldwell. 
It's a slightly cooler area because of its eastern uh, eastern area within the Napa Valley, and so you actually get about an extra week of hang time on these uh, these vines for Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Merlot did really well there for a long time, but now we're starting to realize that a, a lighter style of Cabernet can come out of it as well. Wild Horse Valley is split between Napa and Solano. It's mostly Solano. Uh, these are high elevation and extremely cold by the San Pablo Bay there. And then, of course, Carneros um, split between Napa and Sonoma. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about it when we get into the Sonoma side of things, which is coming up. Imagine that. So that's all it took to look at the entire Napa Valley. It was like 15 or 20 slides. Pretty amazing. Um, when you really break it down, it's not just, hey, it's Napa Valley. I got it. No big deal. There's a lot going on in that valley and a lot to know from a historical standpoint and where it's put American wine on the map. But there's not the short change Sonoma County at all. Uh, and Sonoma County, you can see here to the west, here's Napa, that little small valley. Here's San Pablo Bay, of course, creating that Petaluma wind gap that sucks right through here between the mountain valleys. And you can see a lot of it happens in southern Napa Valley as well before you get up Napa Valley, up the valley. Um, let me just stop share and mute this real quick. Perfect. All right. Let's talk about Sonoma. We're going to break Sonoma down into um, a handful of different areas here. We're going to start with Sonoma Coast. And it's this big area with this blue outline. Man, it's huge, right? It includes Fort Ross Seaview, the Sonoma Coast, Russian River Valley, the Green Valley of Russian River, half of Chalk Hill for some reason, uh, the Petaluma Gap, ABA, which is new, and then Carneros, and then half of Sonoma Valley too. Uh, we're also gonna look at uh, what I like to call its infidel country, uh, which is Rock Pile and Dry Creek together, right on the Dry Creek, you can see that there. Um, you see the Russian River that cuts through Alexander Valley and through Russian River as it heads out to the coast. Uh, we'll look at sort of the eastern AVAs in Alexander Valley, Knights Valley, Chalk Hill, uh, Fountain Grove. And then we'll look at the valley down here, Sonoma Valley, which is mountainous, right? You get Bennett Valley, and then you get the Sonoma Mountain and Moon Mountain here, which are all kind of uh, compiled together. Uh, major subregions for the Sonoma Coast. Uh, of course, we have the Sonoma Coast AVA that covers them all. We took a look at that. Getting it started north of Annapolis, um, it, Depends really more on its nested ABAs for more focused regional wines. The Fort Ross Seaview ABA, established in 2011 for 920 to 1800 feet above sea level only wines. 18 vintners that are on the ridge commonly reaches above the fog line for rocky sunny sites. They like to call this coastal cool maritime climate. You get Hugo soils that are well drained gravelly loam derived from sandstone and shale. Uh, Yorkville, Boomer, and Laughlin soils here as well. Um, and I put a little map of Fort Ross Seaview up here because we probably don't look at it a whole lot, right? Pretty interesting, just inland of the Fort Ross State Park and really right off the ocean. In the south, you find the Carneros AVA, um, established in 1983. Super clay soils here, right? I, I tend to find when I'm drinking Carneros Pinot Noir, I, I find almost like a Crayola box quality to it that I think is derived from those clay soils. You see a lot of Pinot Noir and a lot of Chardonnay here. Most of the side that overlaps in the Napa Valley is used for sparkling wines that are produced there. Uh, you think about Domaine Chandon, Domaine Carneros, places like that. The Petaluma Gap AVA, uh, the newest one, found, well, maybe not the newest, founded in 2017. It straddles really Marin and Sonoma County lines. It's named after that Petaluma wind gap that stretches from Petaluma to the San Pablo Bay. Uh, it's an inland valley, as, as inland valley air heats up, it pulls the cool air in through that mountain opening to the ocean between Tamales Bay uh, and Bodega Bay. So you get the early morning fog, you get late morning sun that burns it off, and then you get a late afternoon cool breeze that brings in the nightly fog. Pretty important to note. Fog, fog, sun, fog. Pretty cool. Uh, the Chalk Hill ABA, we mentioned um, sort of straddles Sonoma Coast ABA. It's inside the Russian River Valley ABA. 
This is warm climate and white volcanic tooth soils. There is no chalk. It is white volcanic that looks like chalk. And it uh, extends up to about 1,600 feet in elevation. You might say, hey, look, this is the Sonoma Coast AVA. Where's the Russian River Valley? It gets its own slide because I think uh, it's important for us to understand um, the Russian River Valley itself and how it's broken down to the locals and how wines produced in each one of these little neighborhoods, as they refer to them, uh, are affected. So we know the Green Valley AVA. That one's easy, right? It's got its own AVA. But there's a handful of other neighborhoods, um, the Middle Reach up here close to Heldsburg, the Eastern Hills, Laguna Ridge, the Santa Rosa Plains, closer to Santa Rosa, and then down south, the Sebastopol foothills. Um, this covers like 14,000 acres. It's huge. So the Middle Reach is some of the area's oldest grapevines. are typically pretty ripe and structured. If you think Gary Farrell, McCrosty, or Motion, uh, a lot of the William Selliam stuff comes from the Middle Reach, where you get that uh, beautiful, intense fruit. The Eastern Hills, sort of the western edge of the Mayakamas Range, uh, it's got the least amount of fog. You got volcanic and sedimentary soils, with western facing uh, areas that get warm afternoon sunlight and they ripen extremely early. Green Valley, the only one with an actual AVA, uh, is known for its gold ridge sandy loam soils. You can see that here, golden. Uh, it le leads to like bright tannins, high acid, and a little richer mouthfeel. Uh, here you'll find Dutton, Goldfield, Freeman, and Costa Brown. Laguna Ridge, again, more Gold Ridge. There's also some Altamont and cooler temperatures here. Uh, Santa Rosa Plains, you'll find a lot more shale, sandstone, and clay. Great for Zinfandel. Um, here you'll find Rodney Strong and Deloach. Uh, and then the Sebastopol Hills, the coolest neighborhood in the Russian River Valley. Tons of this Gold Ridge soil. Um, this is where you'll find Dellinger. Um, as we take a look at another sort of compartmentalized area, the Sonoma Valley, um, to the southeast, you'll see this valley area, very mountainous. Um, you sits between Sonoma Mountain and Moon Mountain District, just west of Mount Peter. The Bennett Valley is nestled between three mountain peaks. It's well drained. Um, you get morning fog and cool breezes here. You'll see Matanzas Creek and Flanagan sit within it. Sonoma Mountain AVA was established in 1985. The western side is rolling hills. Uh, great for Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Syrah. The eastern side is jagged rocks. So this is where they're growing more Cabernet Sauvignon that overlooks the Valley of the Moon. Um, sunny and foggy, but you get a lot, of, a lot more morning sun than some of the other foggy areas. Uh, they're 400 to 1200 foot above sea level, um, only on the northern and eastern slopes. Here you'll find Benziger, <coughs> Kenwood, and Laurel Glen. That Moon Mountain District um, that we talked about being just west of Mount Peter uh, in 2013 was established as an ABA. Western facing slopes here on the Mayakamas Mountains between 600 and 2600 feet above sea level. Uh, Bordeaux and Zin varieties on decomposed igneous rocks. And then we said, yeah, Carneros, it's here too. It shows up all over the place. So now we've looked at the coast and we've looked at Sonoma Valley and we've broken down Russian River. Next, we're going to take a look at Zinfandel uh, country right up here. And here's a picture of Rock Pile. I think it's pretty cool just to take a look at sort of the vineyards growing there. And you can see just how hilly it is. It's west of Lake Sonoma with steep hillsides, ripping winds. Um, the Pritchard Peaks are off in the distance, adding to soil geologic style. It's extremely gravelly, right? <clears throat> Hence the name Rock Pile. Sits between 800 and 2100 feet above sea level. It's above the fog line because of Lake Sonoma being so deep and pulling the fog lower via an immersion layer. There's no moisture. There's tons of sun. It's very rocky, which makes it perfect for Zinfandel. Uh, the mar maritime climate, uh, the moderate temps actually help keep those Zinfandel bunches uniform. If you're familiar with Zinfandel and Malbec, uh, both of those sets of fruit have a tendency to suffer from what we call milleron dage. Uh, or hens and chicks where you get uneven fruit ripening. So you'll have small red berries with big plump blueberries. Uh, here in Rock Pile, it evens, evenly ripens. Great producers of the area include Robert Bialy, St. Francis, Sagacio, and Klein. Just southeast of there is Dry Creek Valley, some of the oldest grape growing in all of California. Uh, gravel and sandy loam. Again, that Sonoma, Lake Sonoma to the north. Uh, you get Dry Creek that, of course, abuts it, 
and Russian River to the south. This is a region two on the Winkler scale. Uh, coastal ranges moderate the oceanic temperature and provide a cool current. Uh, great producers here are A. Raffinelli, Dry Creek Vineyard, Ferrari Carano, Francis Ford Coppola, Geyser Peak, Pedro and Shelley, Ridges, Lytton Springs, Sobragia, and Sagacio. Um, as we get away from Zen Country and the final area of Sonoma County, we find the Eastern Sonoma County APAs. Uh, the first one, the Pine Mountain Cloverdale Peak, of course, which is shared with Mendocino, came online in 2011. <clears throat> it sits within the Alexander Valley, between 1,600 and 3,000 feet above sea level. Uh, it's cooler, it's light, breezy days with sort of warmer nights. Um, Alexander Valley APA, famous, established in 84, uh, Mediterranean with warm, hot summers, extremely arid, really rocky, poor fertility, typically quality Cabernet grows above 400 feet up to 2,500, and the eastern benchlands are particularly suited for it. The Nap uh, Knights Valley AVA in 1983 is really just a northern extension of Calistoga. This is where Mount St. Helena actually sits, um, and uh, I mean, it should be noted that Peter Michael is here, great producer, right? The newest AVA in the area is Fountain Grove, uh, established in 2015. Um, you find Diamond and Spring Mountain just to the east of it. A lot of Bordeaux grapes, a lot of Rhone varieties, a lot of Zinfandel. Um, you'll find the Sonoma Volcanics with some Franciscan complex here, as far as soils are concerned. These are hillside vineyards with the gap in Sonoma Mountain, providing a cooling influence for sure. So that's our two major areas of uh, Napa Valley and Sonoma County broken down, hopefully, into um, some compartmentalized areas that can help you remember where they are, why they grow the grapes that they do, and have uh, intelligent discussions. We're going to continue on and just go through a few details about climate and a few other things uh, before we end the, the presentation today. Uh, the Winkler scale, I think it's important to note, was developed at UC Davis. And so that Cardinaros region that we see is, is cool. It's a region one. But Alexander Valley, uh, Dry Creek, and Knights Valley uh, and the northern areas are Region 3. Um, and Knights Valley really is the warmest ABA in the entire county. Napa Valley is a Mediterranean climate. It's warmer in the north due to the San Pablo Bay that we talked about. The fog is blocked by the Maya Camas to the west, and it enters in two areas. It comes in through that San Pablo Bay in the south, and there's a little small chalk hill gap in the north. You get some in through Calistoga. But this kind of doesn't get to San Helena. Uh, Oak Knoll and Yonville are typically blan blanketed with that fog during the mornings of warm summers. Uh, by the time it hits Oakville, it's considerably thinner and almost gone by San Helena. And then Calistoga gets something that Chalk Hill gap near Diamond Mountain, but it burns off quickly. Sonoma is considered coastal Mediterranean if we want to just say the entire thing. But I think you have to look at each individual ABA to determine what you want to call them. Uh, Lake County, warm days, cool nights. <coughs> I wanted to take a quick moment to talk about diurnal shift, too. Uh, we mentioned that with a lot of different growing regions, and we talked about it today. And I think it's important to note that grapes typically ripen between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. They ripen by photosynthesis, which requires sunlight. So if it's going to ripen at night, the temperature has to be above 50 degrees, and an alternative fuel must be provided. This is where malic acid comes into play. If you have less ripening at night, it means you have more malic acid. Think like Austria and Germany, right? These, these uh, wines have like stone fruit qualities to them. Um, if you have more, it's much more important in warm regions, right? In Napa Valley than it is in cool regions. Napa's diurnal shift is around 20 in the south and gets to be about 40 degrees up in Calistoga. And the higher you get in elevation shrinks the shift particularly above the fog line around 1,400 feet. So that's my little quick aside on diurnal shifting. Uh, rainfall is at its highest in the north, um, actually in, in the mountains. The Maya Camas Mountains seem to more plush and fertile than the Vacas, which appear scorched. This is due to their exposure. Maya Camas has east-facing slopes that receive gentle morning sunlight, whereas the Vaca Mountains are western-facing, and they get that brutal afternoon sunlight. Napa is only five miles wide at its widest and one mile wide in Calistoga and only 30 miles long. Uh, the Maya Camas Mountains to the west and the Vaca to the east, important to note. Uh, different soil types that you'll see throughout, we mentioned Gold Ridge a couple of times uh, in the Russian River and in Green Valley. 
uh, very gravelly in Alexander Valley and Knights Valley. Napa actually has 30 different types of soils, but all derived from three basic bedrocks. And you can kind of break these down. Um, the Great Valley Sequence, the Franciscan Assemblage, and Napa Volcanics, which are the youngest. So the Great Valley and Franciscan, Franciscan Assemblage are sandstone and shale that you see more in the center and western areas. And then uh, the Napa Volcanics are more exposed in the Vacas. Um, and you see less uniform soil uh, in the Vacas than you do in the Maya Campus. The Napa benches are alluvial fans that act as a transition between the fertile valley floor and the rocky hillsides. A lot of people think these are the best growing areas in Napa Valley because you kind of sit between that two to 800 foot elevation um, and you sit right where the fog kind of drops on, on, on the vines. It helps to cool them, bring the acidity just a touch higher. Most of the alluvial fans are located on the western foothills within Napa. The wines we mentioned earlier with Mount Veeder, um, they may not be cultivated at a slope greater than 30 degrees in Napa to avoid erosion. Uh, a few sites were grandfathered in prior to this law, uh, but Mount Veeder specifically sits uh, at around 30 degrees. For grapes in the area, you'll, you'll find Riesling and Gewürztraminer um, that perform alongside Champagne varieties up in Anderson Valley. We sort of mentioned that. Um, Chardonnay was planted to only about 200 acres in the 1940s. It took dominance in the 1970s, uh, only to be, then be supplanted by Cabernet in 92. It's still number two grape and the number one white grape in Napa. Most of it's now today in Oak Knoll, Carneros, and Yountville, uh, though you'll find Kongsgards, The Judge, and Coombsville, uh, and Maya Camus on Mount Venner, Mount Veter, excuse me, in Stony Hill on Spring Mountain. Of course, a lot of the Chardonnay that's produced down in uh, this area is used for sparkling wine too. Red grapes for a couple of different areas. We talked about Bennett Valley in Sonoma Valley. It favors Merlot because it's a little too cool for Cabernet. We, we had a shout out to Dry Creek and Rock Pile for being Zinfandel country. Of course, Eastern Sonoma County with Alexander Valley and Knights Valley for Cabernet. Carneros loves Pinot and Chard. Mendocino Ridge favors Zinfandel. And then I think it's important to note that the Mission grape that landed in San Diego in 1769 made its way as far north as Sonoma. It's also synonymous with Liston Prieto, uh, Palomino Negro, Creole Chica, and Pais uh, in South America. Um, Cabernet, of course, is 46% of the total acreage in Napa, but has only had a foothold since 92. The average price per ton for Cabernet in 2016 in Napa Valley was $6,830, and some actually reached $20,000. It's amazing how much some people are paying for this. You'll find Merlot, Pinot Noir, Zinfandel, uh, Petit Syrah, Syrah, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot. As far as viticultural techniques are concerned, we find VSP, vertical tree positioning in the 80s and drip irrigation in the 70s that led to a total change in styles. And today, 45% of Napa vineyards are certified as Napa green. Uh, we mentioned malolactic and a heavy use of French and American oak and Greek. Um, as of 2011 in Sonoma County, all labels must include Sonoma County on the label, whether or not it also indicates another ABA. And then just a handful of other producers uh, in the coastal Sonoma County area, you'll find Hirsch, Hay, and Markison, true Sonoma Coast, right? Um, we mentioned Dellinger and William Sellian, but also Joseph Swan, critical in Russian River Valley. Green Valley, of course, pioneered by Iron Horse. You'll also find Freeman and Costa Brown there. Uh, Carneros, home to Tat and Jay, and Cordorm, Cordorm U for sparkling. You'll also find Gloria Ferrer there. Anderson Valley is where Rotorer US is. We mentioned sparkling wine. Napa is estimated to have more than a thousand different labels today, a tiny little area. Charles Krug really developed Napa's first winery in 1861 by using a press borrowed by Augustin Harathi from Sonoma. Uh, other pioneers, Engelnook, Fisher, Beringer, Italian Swiss Colony, and of course, Schramsberg. And then, I mean, I always hate to give you guys the vintage charts. I think, you know, we're going to look at some of them and say, well, I, I really like those vintages. Um, it just depends on your drinking style. But in general, uh, what your guests might be looking for if they want uh, powerful styles of Cabernet from Napa Valley, they want to be looking for these vintages in the 2000s uh, and these in the 1980s and 1990s. With a special call out to that 1997 vintage that sort of changed the way uh, we drank wine for about 10 to 15 years. Pretty interesting. That's my show for today. Uh, I hope that uh, 
just provided some insight into California's North Coast, um, particularly in the Napa Valley and Sonoma County, uh, and how to understand what those regions mean, uh, what the wines are that they produce, the great producers that are there, uh, and hopefully uh, this will help you to sell more wine in the future. Cheers, gang. We'll see you next week.